Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to this very final session of the Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp 2021. My name is Chintan Vaishnav, uh, and I serve as the Mission Director for India's Atal Innovation Mission. Our mandate is to create a culture of innovation and entrepreneurship across the nation. Uh, this session, as you know, is a session on business ethics, uh, and we uh, are very, very fortunate to have a very special guest uh, uh, to discuss this topic with Mr. Narayan Murthy, in, uh, the founder of Infosys and one of India's most celebrated business leaders, but more importantly, somebody who has with his own action demonstrated what is it to lead with integrity and moral authority. Uh, the Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp this year, uh, it, it, it set out to teach children how to go from an idea all the way to a digital venture uh, in a course over a course of nine weeks. And I am really happy to say that we had sessions where more than 20,000 children, uh, students uh, of uh, sixth to 12th grade logged in. And uh, we, uh, in total, we had about 9,000 uh, uh, registered teams, 680 uh, mentors from across the industry and teachers who guided them throughout this process. There were 50 expert sessions, not only in, in English, but in uh, in six uh, uh, regional Indian languages. Oh. And we, we, we garnered about 4 lakh uh, views uh, on YouTube so far. Uh, I am pleased to say that today's session will be available in 11 regional languages in the week to come. And so these numbers uh, truly fill me with a, 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 a sense of joy and hope uh, for our nation. Uh, now, let me motivate today's session uh, uh, by asking you a question. Sure. What to do is uh, uh, asking everyone a question. Uh, so we think about it. What to you is an ethical dilemma? Uh, 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 now, when you grow up, uh, you realize that uh, ethical dilemmas are something that uh, people experience from a very young age. Um, uh, uh, but this is not a topic that we uh, really put a spotlight on. But today we're going to do that. And, and to do so, uh, I invite you to consider the following example. Uh, uh, everyone in the audience. Um, <clears throat> Imagine that tomorrow is your birthday and you go out to buy 100 chocolates. And when you come home after buying it, you realize that the shopkeeper by mistake had given you only 90 chocolates. What would you do? Of course, you will rush back and claim your uh, 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 the 10 remaining chocolates, right? Now, imagine a different scenario uh, that you, you come home and you realize that the shopkeeper by mistake had given you 110 chocolates. So you got 10 chocolates more than what you paid for. Uh, do, do you have this strange feeling uh, about what is the right thing to do? I mean, as compared to the first scenario, uh, that 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 little strange feeling is the ethical dilemma. Uh, and and, and uh, as you know, uh, 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 principles or maxims like uh, honesty is the best policy help us uh, do the right thing in such situations. So so. Let me now take that example and apply it to the digital ventures that we are talking about that went on in Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp. There were several people who uh, uh, who created uh, solutions where they collect data from the customer, process data, and give them solutions, uh, services or products or what have you. Now imagine that you have a set of naive, somewhat naive customers who submitted you more data than you asked for. Some of it was even sensitive data, which if somebody got a, a, a hold of, it could harm these customers. What, what What is the right thing for you to do? Is it something that you go back to these customers and say, hey, don't submit this or delete this data or what is what what, what would you do? So again, this this kind of dilemmas, they, they transcend uh, many different parts uh, of our life. Uh, and and every time there is an ethical dilemma, you would see that there is this question of what is the right thing to do. And when you do the right thing is when people say you're ethical. And if you keep doing the right thing over and over and over is when uh, people would say that this is a person of integrity. So, so we're very fortunate uh, to have somebody uh, who, who has been known as a person of great integrity 
uh, Mr. Murthy, who arguably is, is uh, the most experienced Indian when it comes to the intersection of the digital ventures and ethical dilemmas. So, so with that uh, little introduction, uh, uh, let me uh, uh, invite him. Uh, let's give him a very warm welcome uh, to, to, to say a few uh, uh, greetings, and then we will get started. Well, uh, well Professor, uh, thank you very much for this kindness and generosity in, in inviting me to share time with a set of extraordinary youngsters. We all face ethical dilemmas in our lives, on and off. You gave two examples of ethical dilemmas, and many, many more. I have tried to use, I am not claiming I have been successful, but I have tried to use two tests to resolve such dilemmas. Not for a second am I saying that I have been successful 100% of the time, no. Those two tests are first, following the golden rule, which is do unto others what you would do and to what you would want them to do unto you. That is the first question that you have to ask. Do unto others what you would want them to do unto you in a in an exactly same situation. That's the first principle I use. And most times the answer becomes very clear pretty quickly. The second test that I have used is if you are in a country, in a place where nobody will recognize you, nobody is, will recognize you. Let's say you are in uh, Uruguay where you don't know anybody, nobody knows you. How will you conduct yourself in such a situation? I think as the professor has spoken to you people many times in the past, intelligence is about reducing complexity to simple decisions. That's really what intelligence is. So therefore, my request to all these wonderful youngsters who are assembled here is to ask these questions and be true to your conscience. Be true to the answer that your conscience comes out with to the extent possible, as many times as possible, and conduct yourself. I would like to say 100% of the time, but I don't think I can claim to have followed that 100% of the time. I, I'm sure you people know a very good story about Mahatma Gandhi. Once a, a lady went to Mahatma Gandhi with her child and said, Gandhi ji, this child wants to eat more and more and more sweet. Would you please advise this child that Eating so many, so much of sweets is not good. Mahatma Gandhi said, can you come back to me after 15 days? She said, okay. 
she went back and she came back after 15 days and Mahatma Gandhi then said beta eating sweets will spoil your teeth it is not good you know for health you will put on weight this that etc so the lady asked Mahatma Gandhi a, a simple question Gandhi ji you could have given the same answer the first time I came to you, you did not need to make me wait for 15 days. This is known to everybody. I just wanted you to say these things because words coming from you would be taken seriously by this young child. He said, Betty, there was a reason why I did this. He said, look, I wanted to find out how difficult it is not to eat sweets. So I created so many situations in the last 15 days where my colleagues offered me sweet. And I wanted to learn to overcome that temptation. I realized, I wanted to realize how difficult it is. Now, fortunately for me, God has been very kind and I could overcome. Now I have the moral authority to advise this child not to eat sweets. So I think uh, it's very, very important for every one of us to put oneself in that situation, that is, do unto others what you want them to do unto you. And uh, number two, as I pointed out earlier, be in a situation where nobody will recognize. In this particular you know, situation of Mahatma Gandhi, nobody even knew why Gandhi ji was refusing sweets. Everybody would have been quite happy if he had eaten sweets. They were actually disappointed that they didn't eat. So that is the first rule that I was speaking about. Conduct yourself as if you are in a land where nobody will recognize you, as if you are on Mars and then you do the right thing. I would say that these two simple tests are likely to help you. There is no guarantee that you will succeed 100%. I have really not come across any person who has been successful 100%. I don't claim to have been so. But these are all, they all are reached asymptotically as we say. That is, it takes more and more and more effort to reach a higher and higher and higher level of perfection. Anyway, let me stop here. I'll be very happy to uh, answer your specific questions. And so I'll, I'll stop here, Professor. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Murthy, for uh, such a candid uh, uh, uh response and those two two uh, wonderful rules uh, by which one can uh, lead their whole life and keep improving so uh, the uh, the format for today's session uh, is uh, that uh, uh, the students are going to pose questions for you and so let us let me get us started and uh, let us go to bhavansh first uh, who will be asking the first question sure good evening sir Good evening. Yeah. Sir, my name is Han Saxena. I am from yeah. Delhi Public School, Sector 45. Guru Gram. Thank you, sir. I study in class seven. Yeah. Sir, my question for you is as one of the leading entrepreneurs, not only in the country, but worldwide, all eyes are on you all the time. Any misdoing by those around you or those working for the company 
can easily malign the image that you have created for Infosys. How have we ensured all those working with you also follow a similar culture of strong Infosys continues to remain a name to reckon with? You know, Varnish, this is a very good question. Excellent question. What you said is very tough to do. While good culture takes time to develop, bad culture spreads very fast. That's what I have realized. I believe that the best instrument for creating a culture of ethics is leadership by example. That's what Mahatma Gandhi taught us the last century. Most of you were, I mean, I think all of you were not born except the professor and me. What Mahatma Gandhi taught us it holds good today, tomorrow, and forever. Now, I want to tell you a small story, if you don't mind, about how the leaders, the elders, the seniors, in any situation, have to conduct themselves for their younger ones to follow. Let me give you this story. I believe there was a family. It, the family had the husband, wife, a child, and the husband's father. The husband's father, you know, father-in-law was an old man. Poor guy, he was old. So he needed help, and then, you see, some of us, as we grow older, we become a little bit finicky. We spend time saying, this is not good, that's not good, etc. So the wife was very upset. Every day she would get upset with her husband. And said, this man must go, this man must go. The father-in-law must go, etc. One day, the husband got very upset. He said, don't worry, tomorrow I will take care of that. So next morning, he got up. He had his breakfast or whatever it is. And he said, today, I am going to take my father and bury him alive. I will dig a hole and put him there and bury him alive, and I'll come back so that you will not be worried. So he told the father, well, let's go to the forest. You will also have a little bit of walk and all of that. Poor father, he came. The son, who was only five years old, he said, no, Papa, I also want to come with you. He said, OK, come. So three of them walked. They went into the forest and the father told, as uh, the, the husband told the father to sit nearby and then he started digging a hole. So the son asked the father, the, this child, Papa, why are you digging this hole? The father, you know, he wanted to be honest with his son. So he said, Beta, I am digging this because I want to uh, I, I, I want to bury my father uh, in this hole and because we, you know I want to bury him. So he, then he continued his work and then he found nearby the son was also digging a hole. So father got surprised. He said, Beta, what are you doing? So the child said, I am also digging a hole because I want to bury you. So the point I am making is that there is nothing 
as powerful as leadership by example. If you want to communicate good or bad values, and your followers will pick up those habits very, you know, with a lot of enthusiasm. Because they're all the time watching the leader. The followers watch the leader very carefully and they want to imitate the leader. As I told you in that example. So therefore, there is no need to keep on repeating your advice many times because actions speak louder than words. Now, in large companies, leaders will not be seen by everybody since the organization may operate in different locations and not all levels of employees have access to the leader. So it is very important to ensure that the leaders at lower levels follow your principles and, be, and practice leadership by example. So you'll have to train them. They will watch you. Let's say uh, you have four people reporting to you and they will watch, they will learn from you, they will analyze. They will learn and then they will become messengers of your idea by walking the talk, by practicing the precept. So I would say that that is the best way. The second thing that we did at Infosys was we created a concept called value champion. We had value champions in each department in each function, in each location. Let's say out of 100 people, we would uh, select, not we, rather the employees in that group, in that location, they themselves would vote as to who was the person who conducted with the best values. He or she didn't matter. And then that day, the annual day of Infosys, they would be honored. They would get some gift. They would get, get an opportunity to speak to others, etc. So you will have to create some laudable incentives, some good incentives for your people to follow good values. So first is leadership example. Second, create messengers at lower levels. Third, create value changes. This is what I would say. Wonderful. Uh, that's that. That's a great formula. Um, so let's let's go to the next question. Uh, this comes from uh, Anshita. Uh, Hello, sir. I'm Anshita Nanda from class ninth from Kya Manglim Girls School. Wonderful. So you have built such a successful multinational company from scratch. I wanted to know how we can create products and solutions that cater to needs of different communities and cultures locally and globally while ensuring that no one is discriminated. Well, some of you will become entrepreneurs. You will transform this world in ways that I cannot imagine. It'll be so wonderful. All that I can say that my best wishes to you, we will, uh, we will cheer you as you're running this marathon. We will wish you the best, etc. Entrepreneurship is using the power of an idea to create jobs and wealth. To succeed as an entrepreneur, you need to do the following. First, have an idea which has not occurred to anybody else in the world and which is useful to individuals, corporations, communities, institutions, or the society. 
such ideas that have not yet occurred to anybody else in the world or what is called or what are called discontinuities in the marketplace that's the technical word facebook google uh, uber amazon and airbnb are all good examples of such idea there was no other company that did this kind of work before they started this second most however most ideas improve on existing ideas not not every one of us is as fortunate as the 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 founders of these companies to come out with an idea which didn't exist before most of us come out with an existing ideas if our idea is one such we have to make sure that our idea outperforms all existing ideas in at least one attribute that could be cost it or a price it could be productivity it could be comfort it could be cycle time whatever it is third you must be able to express the power of your idea in a simple sentence and not a complex sentence or a compound sentence my young friends this is extremely important no ifs and no buts because of a very important reason simple ideas are easy to explain easy to understand and easy to execute fourth this is very very important i didn't do it the first time i became an entrepreneur and i failed i founded a company called softronix and i had not done what i am going to say now and i failed that is conduct an inexpensive quick and simple test marketing exercise to assess whether your idea will actually succeed in the marketplace you don't have to spend too much money you can talk to people that are friendly with you your family your teachers your you know uh, community friends etc etc because if you don't conduct this test marketing marketing exercise and proceed further then you would have spent a lot of your time and money and then if you realize that there was no market for your idea then it is be very disappointing fifth you must put together a team that has complementary set of expertise experience and skills what do i mean by that that is you must have one person who understands uh finance another person who understands human resources third person who understands technology uh you know a fourth person who understands sales etc etc so bring such a team together if you can finally such a team must have or must follow an enduring value system and raise the confidence of each team member in every other team member this is extremely important because when you are an entrepreneur when you are in your initial years you have to focus all your time on your idea you don't the moment you start having doubt in the integrity of your team members then your productivity comes down so therefore it is very very important that all of you have the same enduring value system now discriminating against any specific culture or community should not be practiced by any open minded progressive fair and secular society now my values or your values 
would come from your parents, your teachers, and your early friends. I learned lots of good values from my parents, from my primary school teacher, my, from my high school teacher, from my college teachers, my bosses in India and in France, where I used to work, and from my friends. Whenever I go abroad, even today, I observe very carefully what good values I can learn from that place, from that country, and what not so good values I should not take back, take back to my country. That is what I would say. Thank you for packing a lifetime of wisdom in such um, simple terms. Um, uh, let's go to the next question, uh, sure. which comes from uh, Abhay. A very good evening, sir. Yeah. I am Abhay Kumadas in class 12 from Kela Samaja Border School, Jamshedpur, Jharkhand. I believe that the value of an idea lies in the using of it. And I am not the kind of person who tries to be cool or trendy. I am definitely an individual. So my question is, what strategies must I use to remain true to my values and principles when I am challenged or tested? You must have faced numerous circumstances in your career. How did you navigate a difficult scenario in which you had to take a tough decision to stay true to your ethics? One that would have tremendously benefited the company, but would demand a compromise of values. You know, building a company in the India of the 1980s was very, very difficult. The government was anti-business. The rules and laws shackled us unbelievably. It took two to three years and about 30 to 50 visits to Delhi to get a license to import a computer. There was no current account convertibility, which meant that traveling abroad, even for a few days, required the permission of RBI. You could not open offices abroad because the government wouldn't release you hard currency dollars. It took five to seven years to get a telephone connection. And banks just did not understand what software was. And therefore, they gave us neither the working capital loan, that is, money to run the company on a day-to-day -day basis or term loan to buy equipment for our work. Many of these restrictions could have been overcome using speed money or corruption. All of you know about speed money. However, we did not do so. Values are about standing firm and ready to pay a certain cost or price, whatever you want to say, for your beliefs and convictions. Otherwise, there is no value. Yes, sir. We, cho we chose the option to accept delays in approvals and even forego some of our legitimate rights and benefits rather than give in to corruption. As I said somewhere else the other day, our context determined our aspirations. Now, once we stood firm a couple of times and not given to corruption, even the corrupt officials started respecting us and they became our allies. From then onwards, they did not delay our cases for a very simple reason. 
every human being has an inner conscience that propels him or her to do the right thing at least a few times. Also, these officials wanted some examples to show that they were not corrupt. So when somebody accused these officials of corruption, the officials would point to us and say, ask Infosys whether we are corrupt. So after the initial setback, we became highly respected in the society for our honesty, and that helped us a lot. And we became stronger and stronger. Therefore, this refusal to cave in became a big asset for Infosys, and we became a strong company. Let me stop here. Well, thank you for depicting that uh, virtuous cycle of becoming stronger and stronger by doing the right thing over and over. Um, let's, uh, uh, let's see who the next question is from. Uh, the next question comes from Akshada. Yeah. Akshada, are you here? Good evening, sir. It's my privilege to talk to you today. I am Akshada Vasi, student of ninth class at Ryan International School, Chandigarh. In this boot camp, I have made an app which is based on premium business model. For paid teachers, I am thinking of setting up price which includes all the costs of development, maintenance, upgrades, and etc. with a certain percentage of profit margin. I want to know that I set the profit percentage of say 500 percent. Would that be against business ethics, sir? How do I ensure that the pricing of my products is within the ethical standards and allows access to those in need? Thank you. Oh, that's a brilliant question. Absolutely. First of all, congratulations on your product. Charging outrageous prices and making vulgar profits are not what decent people do if they want their companies to live long. This can happen in monopoly situations and the governments all over the world, all over the world, without exception, prevent companies from becoming monopolies. Fortunately, we have the Competition Commission of India charged with this responsibility right at the, in New Delhi. Now, let me come to the economic rationale as to how actually you won't be able to do what you, you I wouldn't say you suggested, what you thought could be done by somebody. While such prices may seem very attractive in the short term, a market with many players has the built-in mechanism to bring such vulgar profits to normalcy very quickly. This is basic economics. Let me explain. The marketplace operates on the fundamental principle that there is a seller and there is a buyer. When a transaction takes place without any duress of their own free will between the seller and the buyer, the price of the product is set. Let's assume that your product is so fantastic that the first time you will get your 500% profit because you have designed an unbelievable product and there is one buyer who buys. However, there is also a concept in economics called elasticity of demand. That is, for a given level of production, Higher the price, lower the demand. Lower the price, higher the demand. Automatically, what will happen is, the moment people saw that Akshadar 
came out with this fantastic idea and she is making 500% profit other producers will manufacture similar products they will enter the product they will sell at lower prices somebody will start making 400% profit somebody will go with 300 etc and eventually they will bring the price down to a new what we call equilibrium point so by and large your desire not your desire your your idea that somebody could charge 500 percent profit will be short-lived and under normal circumstances you will be automatically forced to reduce your price there is another market phenomenon called branding branding is about delivering differentiated value in terms of quality features and admiration from your friends family members etc etc for your ownership of that particular product such a product creates a pride of ownership in a customer's mind that is you know when i was small i went to delhi in uh, 1960 or so i was hardly 14 years and i found you know we had never seen refrigerators because i came from a, a lower middle class family and my cousin's house he had kept a refrigerator right in the drawing room why did she keep it in the drawing room because she was proud of owning that wonderful godrej refrigerator and she wanted everybody to see that she is the owner of that refrigerator so that is what is called pride of ownership now for example iPods are much more expensive than equally good or nearly as good Chinese and Japanese products. Now, let me take another example. Lexus cars from Toyota are more expensive than other cars from the same manufacturer Toyota. It is more expensive than Toyota Camry. People still pay the asking price for Lexus and apple due to an economic phenomenon called value leverage economists say price is what you pay and value is what you receive most branded products deliver a higher value perception to the buyer than me too products let me give you an example if apple charges a price of rupees 30000 for its watch and the cust and the customer generally perceives a value of let's say 60000 rupees from that watch here the value leverage that is value over price is 2 because the the value perception is equal to 60000 rupees the price the cost, price you have paid is 30000 so 60000 over 30000 is 2 on the other hand if a chinese company charges a price of rupees 3000 there are many wonderful watches that you can buy for 2999 that are available today on amazon flipkart etc and if the customer perceives a value of rupees 4500 for that watch then the value leverage for the chinese watch is just 1.5 as against the value leverage of 2 for the apple watch in such a circumstance if the customer can afford to pay rupees 30000 he or she will go for the more expensive up apple watch 
So it is very, very important for you people to realize that there are multiple factors that determine the price, that determine what is acceptable for people, you know, branding and all of that. So let me wow. start it. Thank you so much. And I am uh, so amazed. Um, and this is why one has got to admire children, uh, young people that uh, they have the capability to ask. Uh, a ninth grader has the capability to ask, which took us a question that took us all the way to Adam Smith and the neoclassical economics yeah. and its foundation. Exactly. So exactly. wonderful. Uh, let's go to the next question, which comes from Tahira. Wonderful. Yeah. Good yes, evening, Tina, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I am Tahira Khan of class 12th from Air Force School Hibal in Bangalore. Yeah. Um, oh, wonderful. You are from my city. <laughs> wonderful. Yeah. Uh, my question to you is, there is no doubt that technological innovations have not only added economic value to the firms, but also but also benefited the users with innovative products uh, and services in terms of ease of use, functionality, efficiency, uh, novelty, etc. Nevertheless, these innovations have undesirable consequences to the society and or the environment. Uh, many innovations have been blind to ethical impacts and concerns, uh, which I shall call uh, innovation ethical blindness completed yeah. the value capture of innovation how can we solve this problem well this is another wonderful question it is so nice that you youngsters are thinking so deeply my view is that there is nothing inherently good or bad in any technology when a technology is used by good people, it adds value to the society. It makes people happy. When it is used by bad people, it causes harm to the society. It makes people sad. For example, you can use nuclear fission. I don't know how many of you know that so far all our uh, nuclear plants, nuclear bombs, they all work on the basis of nuclear fission, not, not nuclear fusion. Sun gives us all that wonderful light, energy, etc. on the basis of nuclear fusion. Okay, anyway, that's for another day. For example, you can use nuclear fission for generating clean electricity like France does. France, in France, about 90% of the electricity that is used is generated by nuclear fission uh, plants. Now, on the other hand, you can destroy humanity by nuclear bombs, like the US did to the Japanese in the Second World War. The use of technology for good purposes become possible when the world creates platforms for sociologists, philosophers, economists, political scientists, doctors, psychologists, intellectuals to discuss ideas and opinions based on data, facts, and experience and create a climate of opinion in favor of good uses of these technologies. That's why we need sociologists, we need political scientists, we need philosophers, we need uh, psychologists, etc., etc. Only engineers, scientists, doctors will not suffice for a good society. I want you people to understand that. Now, Fortunately, there are also several multilateral institutions 
basically that means institutions where many nations are members that mitigate the chances of these technologies falling into the hands of terrorists and evil players. Now, universities and institutions of higher learning are extremely important for a society because they play an important role in educating youngsters on the good uses of technology. That's where I am a great believer in universities and institutions of higher learning, which focus on liberal arts, which focus on sociology, which focuses on philosophy, which focuses on psychology, et cetera, et cetera. So the most important thing, Tahira, is to create a climate of opinion against bad uses of technology. That is where institutions like Greenpeace and others, you know, uh, NGOs that are fighting for climate change initiatives, they all become very, very important for us. And that's why we have to encourage such institutions. Let me stop here. Wonderful. Once again, I'm quite amazed that this question has taken us to uh, the uh, topics like uh, technological hubris, and neutrality, um, interdisciplinarity. Wonderful. Uh, let us go to the youngest member uh, on this call today. Uh, let's go to Abhishek. Abhishek, your turn now. Wonderful. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, sir. It's a pleasure to meet you. Sir, sir. Uh, I'm from Abhya. I'm from Bhattagi International School, BIS, Sector B, Vasant Kunj. Sir, yeah. my question to you is, that in the recent times there have been a lot of new innovations most important being the innovation of artificial intelligence ai during yeah. the think up and boot camp some of us applied ai techniques to build a solution when i first learned the uh, existence of ai i found it both fascinating and frightening today supercomputers analyze petabytes of data related to human behavior and our preferences through virtuality collated information be it pictures sounds history images stories or every imaginable form of communication and make independent judgments of who we are so so how can we make people believe in artificial intelligence you know thank you very much such wonderful question coming from a seventh grade for is very heartening about the future of our country. Artificial intelligence or AI is about computing machines mimicking human thinking and behavior to automate any routine and predictable task. Of course, there has been a lot of work going on to use probabilistic or Bayesian approaches. I don't want to get into those here. Uh, uh, Bayesian approaches to, to artificial intelligence and machine learning. Now, some of the early adopters of AI have been natural language processing, game playing, expert systems, robotics, image and voice recognition, medical diagnosis, and now, of course, the biggest rage is self-driving cars. However, most experts in the field, your uh, professor comes from the most advanced university in the world, MIT, and he would know 100 times better than I would However, since you have asked me this question, I am going to answer. However, most experts in the field believe that we are still far from a time when the machines can attain the human level of thinking and judgment or what computer scientists used to call 
a passing a Turing test. I will not go into it, but that's that's the technical word. Clearly, AI and machine learning have brought lots of benefits to humanity. There is a fear amongst most nations whether human beings will be replaced by machines and that will lead to loss of large number of jobs. My own view is that these technologies when used as assistive technologies will enhance job opportunities for our youngsters. Bank computerization, ATMs, you know, I mean, internet, I mean, e-commerce, uh, then uh, financial inclusion. These are all good examples of how they have created a large number of jobs. So therefore, it's fair to say that the past data on automation supports this. Also, please remember that most developed nations that have embraced technology enthusiastically even before India did have very low levels of unemployment. This is a point that you people must keep in mind when people argue that technology is going to lead to unemployment. Now, these technologies will be deployed effectively in a nation if there are three important ingredients. Policies, talent, and applications, the right applications. Experts will have to ponder deeply on creating policies that will take advantage of these technologies and create disincentives for not so desirable uses of these technologies. We already discussed in answer to a previous question, right? This issue. The policies should aim to incentivize the development and use of applications of these technologies in basic facilities like education, healthcare, clean water, clean air, electricity, nutrition, supply chain, manufacturing, agriculture, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, as well as in private investments to make them more efficient, less taxing on the environment, less costly and accessible to more and more people as early as possible. For example, internet has brought the power of financial inclusion. It would not have happened without data communication and internet, okay. So therefore, it is very, very important that some of you who will become policy experts should try and incentivize the development of such applications. But equally important is the development of talent for learning these technologies. That's where I would stop. Thank you, Mr. Murthy. I want to be mindful of uh, the time. It's 531. Uh, and I, I actually want to ask you uh, if you would be kind to stay for five to seven minutes more. We have one. We will, uh, we'll do, we'll do that. Okay. I, I would. Another thing, point I have another thing at six, but I will stay for uh, five, five to seven minutes because then I have to prepare for my next meeting. <laughs> okay. Excellent. I think that will make Aryan really happy. Aryan, it's your turn. Good evening, sir. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Arjun Sachin. I am yeah. a student. I am studying in class 6. I am a student of Army Public School Amritsar. Fantastic. Huh. So my question is, huh. you have led to multiple in successful initiatives and organizations where people come from different cultures, backgrounds, and even countries. Hmm. 
how you and how you blend together to work towards a single goal of a company and how do you ensure there is unity within diversity you know arin this is again uh, a brilliant question i don't think i could have asked such a good question when i was your age a leader has to be a uniter and not a divider the most important responsibility of a leader is to raise the aspiration hope confidence energy and enthusiasm of his or her people a leader must make must do whatever it's necessary to make a person feel an inch taller in the leader's presence that's really if i want to sum it up in a very simple sentence if you become a leader ensure that people who come to you they feel an inch taller when they leave when they uh, go back that is their confidence is higher their enthusiasm is higher they will say i will conquer this i will do this plausibly impossible stuff etc his or her main job is to craft a vision which is noble and in which every one of his people finds betterment i cannot accept a leader he says i will be a leader only for this set of people and not for that set of people that is not a true leader a leader therefore has to rise above region religion caste and economic classes a leader's vision has to be stunning aspirational and should as i said before enthuse every member of the community of the country late robert kennedy you know is the brother of late president john kennedy he used the words of john marsha and he defined leadership by his famous words and i will quote exactly what he said he said most people see things as they are and wonder why i dream of things that were that never were and then say why not that is a true leader in other words a leader has to imagine something that nobody else had dreamt of and then say why not his people should say why not moving towards that vision requires a lot of hard sacrifice hard work discipline deferred gratification confidence hope and enthusiasm such attributes come to the people when the followers trust the leader fully it is very very important for you youngsters to remember that a leader cannot enthuse a set of people and then say no i won't enthuse those a small section of other people this is what mahatma gandhi did when he galvanized the entire nation to fight for our freedom he realized that the best way to make people commit to huge sacrifice was for him to show leadership by example let me tell you a story you know as you know mahatma gandhi insisted in traveling by third class meeting lots of people eating the same food that is available on railway stations etc etc so his uh, 
compatriots who are worried. Who knows? Somebody may poison him. So they used to travel with him, travel with him in plain clothes, and ensure that he was as safe as possible. Sarojini Naidu, one of his compatriots, once joked. She said, "It takes a fortune to keep this old man in poverty." Now, it was well worth it because he brought us. He was fighting for a very noble cause. It was he realized that he had to represent the poorest Indian. That's how he conducted himself. I'm sure you people know that when he went to meet King George the Sixth in London. He went in a loin cloth, his normal dress, and when the reporters asked him as he came out of the palace, Buckingham Palace, Mahatma, I mean, you are you are dressed so spartanly. You know what he said? He said, "Don't worry, the king had enough clothes for both of us." Both of us. <laughs> so. The important thing to remember is that if you people want to be leaders, you have to lead by example. You have to walk the talk and practice the precept. And at the same time, it is very important to create incentives for people to work towards such a vision. They have to realize that if we fought for freedom of India, then these are the advantages that we will have. So, therefore, those incentives could be hope for a better material comfort, better responsibility, better respect in the eyes of the world, and a better future for your children and grandchildren. Therefore. It is very, very important for you as leaders to create a certain hope, certain incentives, certain nobility of purpose in your people if you want to achieve the plausibly impossible. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, what an hour this has been uh, to bring us uh, to a close of this uh, Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp uh, 2021. Uh, let me very quickly, uh, let us very quickly say a few thank yous. First to Mr. Murthy for packing so much wisdom in such simple terms about such a difficult topic. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Of course, to children for asking uh, uh, such yeah. uh, insightful questions yeah. so boldly. They um, deserve much bigger thanks, much bigger appreciation than anything else because, I mean, here amongst you, you have whatever, 3,000 people who, if they are guided properly, like you are doing, can actually transform our nation. So I, I think we are all very thankful to you, Chintan, for the extraordinary work that you're doing, for bringing enthusiasm to this set of people. What is very important is that they will continue to have such uh, role models as they become older and older and older. Somehow, a lot of us get lost in the way because we don't see such role models. So I hope they will continue to see role models like you as they become older and older. So my best wishes. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank so you, sir. Off, if it is okay with you.
Thank you. Very kind of you. Th thank, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. And bye-bye. Uh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, we will, for the rest of us, we will just quickly uh, finish up uh, the very final part of this program. Uh, the, the 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 thanks that came to me, uh, of course, I must pass it on uh, to those who actually did the work. Uh, the ATL team at Artel Innovation Mission worked relentlessly to put together uh, this Tinkerpreneur Boot Camp. Uh, and uh, not just that, uh, but uh, they, they, they are continuing to work on, as I said, uh, making these sessions available in uh, 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 regional languages of India. Uh, so, so a big thanks uh, to them uh, for the entire boot camp as well as uh, uh, the wonderful session that we had today. Uh, of course, all of this work would not be possible without uh, um, without uh, the tinkerpreneurs themselves uh, who participated so enthusiastically and and all of the expert speakers who taught them, the industry leaders and sponsors who guided them and supported them all throughout the journey. And this journey is not over yet. We have a few more things to come. Uh, all of these students would get their participation certificate. The top teams and mentors are going to be recognized. Uh, the top teams will also get opportunity to showcase their work to uh, other exciting people uh, like uh, Mr. Murthy. Um, uh, and, and the mentors are going to get uh, fellowship opportunities. So, so there is more to come. Uh, but for today, uh, at the moment, uh, that's it from our Tel Innovation Mission, uh, where we uh, uh, work together to build the innovation ecosystem of India. Uh, and, and, and before we end, we have an exciting video to culminate uh, the entire journey of Tinkerpreneur Bootcamp uh, uh, this year. So let us, let us watch the video.
Excellent. Thanks everyone for joining us. Namaste. Good evening. Thank you so much.